unmasking the real impact of internet shutdowns in Africa. Um, please have a seat. We have a very exciting panel with us. Um, they're all gonna introduce themselves uh, because some of their names are too hard for Kenyans to pronounce. <laughs> but they're all gonna introduce themselves. Um, they bring different perspectives. We have um, civil society, we have uh, business, telcos, we have um, international NGOs, and uh, we have legal perspectives. So please take a seat, we're just about to start. So far, so good. <laughs> and I'm hashtag Grace. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm just going to uh, ask each of the panelists, uh, starting from the right, to introduce themselves. <laughs> Sorry, he picked on me. Um, afternoon, everyone. My name is Fadzai Matsingira, Faz for the Kenyans. Um, I'm a policy analyst on the Facebook uh, Africa Public Policy Team. Um, I focus on a number of issues, but um, content policy, internet disruptions, and privacy. Uh, hello, everyone. I am, uh, my name is Andreas uh, Ravenlow. I uh, work for an NGO based in Copenhagen. We work with press freedom issues, freedom of expression, uh, media and conflicts, but I also sit on the board of what's called the Global Network Initiative, um, which is a sort of uh, forum for um, uh, groups like Facebook and Google and others and, and human rights groups and freedom of expression uh, organizations. So I'm also talking a little bit from that perspective, I understand, um, and I'm happy to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Walter Dickman. I I'm a technology law and policy advisor at ENCODE, a legal advisory company based here in South Africa. Um, we specialize in, well, technology law as a very broad umbrella field uh, of the law. Um, we conduct research, we provide advisory services regarding various pieces of legislation. And yeah, we have a, an African focus and yeah, some, just quickly, some areas of law privacy. Uh, we do intellectual property advice, uh, prop uh, IP law advice. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Wakabi? Hi, my name is Wakabi, Wairagara Wakabi, and I work for CIPESA. Uh, we also specialize in many things, including this forum. <laughs> Thank you for bringing us here, Wakabi. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fiona Songa. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Technology Service Providers Association of Kenya that brings together Kenyan ICT industry with telcos, the ISPs, and uh, yeah, the guys who, give you, who enable you to get onto the internet. Thank you, Fiona. And um, without picking on you, uh, Fazai, <laughs> I just have to explain that uh, Fazai um, spends a lot of time in Kenya, so um, we people uh, who also spend a lot of time in Kenya uh, <laughs> are normally happy to uh, just speak on her. So uh, without uh, picking on you, uh, maybe you could just um, uh, start by telling us why um, uh, Facebook, which is not um, an ISP, would be interested in um, uh, measuring the impact of um, uh, of shutdowns on the economy. Thanks, Grace. Um, I consider myself an honorary Kenyan, so it's okay. Um, I think perhaps the best place to start is to just reiterate Facebook's mission, um, which is to give people the power to build communities and bring the world closer together. And in order to do that, we've got to, that, uh, we've, we think about what barriers there are to, to do that, and part of that is obviously internet disruption. So trying to think through barriers to freedom of expression, trying to think through to barriers of um, how to get people to connect. From an Africa public policy perspective specifically was the recognition that internet disruptions in sub-Saharan, well, in Africa, have increased threefold over the last two to three years. 
And that for us means that we needed to sit and think about why that is happening. What are the root causes behind that? But also to try and think through what is the impact of that? And not only economic, which I think is obviously a really important part of the conversation, but also social. And what do those disruptions mean for people who do want to bring communities together and who do want to connect and share? So that is the main reason why we, um, we work very closely with local organizations. So organizations like Kiktonet um, in Kenya, Sepesa, um, SIPIT, and Stratmore Law School. Um, and we work with them to try to think through the research around getting that sort of data together. So in other words, Facebook also loses money when we shut down the internet? I think it's, a, it ha it's always a lot bigger than economic. Um, I think the civic engagement, I mean obviously we're a business, so um, I'm not going to lie and say that we, don't, it's, we operate not for profit. But I think it's, our mission is far bigger than just an economic one. The civic engagement that happens on our platform, the stories that we hear, what people are able to do because of um, the family of apps is something that, if more than anything, that is why the mission is so important to us, and to me very personally as well. So um, yes, I'm, I think we act, I'm thinking about it in far bigger than just an economic motive. Yeah. Um, um, yes, the love is still there. And, <laughs> and um, uh, just to bring in um, um, a global perspective, uh, because um, the internet is uh, interconnected, so it's not just a matter of um, the one country that is experiencing a shutdown, but um, it it's, it's, um, affects um, everything from a global perspective. We'll hear from Andreas, who um, on the one hand, you, you work with, um, you defend uh, freedom of the media, but on the other hand, you also serve uh, at the board of GNI, which is um, an initiative bringing together, or better still, you can explain to us. Uh. Uh, sure. Um, GNI is a uh, forum for, as I said before, uh, tech companies and uh, telecommunications companies and human rights groups uh, to come together and have some of the tricky conversations around when, let's say, uh, in the rare instance that a national law doesn't comply with the international standards on human rights. Um, to see how companies are doing in terms of conforming to their, uh, their commitments to international human rights standards and, and how they're dealing with uh, the national settings. And that's a, a sort of a trusted space to have that conversation with, with groups like Human Rights Watch and CPJ and Internews and uh, the uh, organization that I represent. So to, to, to uh, bring the, the discussion into a forum where there can be a little bit of a frank discussion. Um, so I think for, for all of the groups involved in GNI, there's a, um, uh, it's on everyone's minds uh, when the internet is shut down in X country because whether you're a human rights group or whether you're uh, a company, um, it's, it's, uh, it's your constituency in one way or the other um, that is affected by an internet uh, disruption, um, it, whether it's uh, f from an economic perspective or from a human rights based uh, perspective. So, um, and GNI has uh, been involved previously in uh, developing two other studies, um, which are also mentioned in, in the report that's being launched, um, one uh, done by Deloitte and another done by the Brookings Institution, uh, which uh, didn't have a regional or, or, or local perspective, but sort of looked at internet, uh, the economic impact of internet disruption uh, more generally, and um, also has in the past uh, encouraged uh, localized versions of these types of studies to, to um, take into account the, the unique nature, of, for example, in Africa, of how the uh, of, of how ICT affects the economy. Um, so, so that's uh, where GNI's stake in it, if you will. Um, and uh, yeah, so so um, that's. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andreas. Um, do you think uh, just a really quick follow up? Do you think um, this kind of global initiatives are having any impact on the African scene because? GNI gives out statements all the time, but we still continue to have uh, shutdowns in Africa. So do you think you're having any impact? Um, I think it's very difficult to say anything about statements, whether they have any impact in general, uh, whether they come from GNI or anyone else. Um, I think studies like this um, that look at uh, 
you know, the economic impact of, of disruptions, for example, is really, you know, hitting governments where it hurts uh, around uh, the kind of um, statements and, and sort of public outrage campaigns and so on, I think are, are, are need to go hand in hand with these other types of initiatives that have, uh, that show the tangible uh, economic losses for, uh, uh, for a country's GDP. Okay, and um, Fiona, maybe to come to you um, and to connect with um, what Andreas is saying about um, trying to show governments um, how the internet is connected to what governments are supposed to be doing, which is making an economic environment that is good for their people. Um, you have been involved in uh, several initiatives um, to like a different approach to uh, addressing this problem of uh, internet shutdowns. Um, I know in one of these initiatives you had proposed or um, that governments that uh, shut down the internet should also be shut off from the internet. So maybe to get your thoughts on um, uh, the economic impact of uh, shutdowns and some of the ways you think um, that uh, we could be addressing this problem. To start with, uh, for in, a, in order for government to be able to, one of the things governments need to do to be able to create a suitable economic um, environment is to leverage on existing technologies. ICT is one of those technologies that governments should be able to leverage on so that they can be able to create a conducive uh, economic environment for all economic sectors. Because ICT is a driver for other sectors, to, an enabler for other sectors to grow and to be more efficient, more effective, better service delivery, and really just streamline uh, things. Now, uh, part of the challenge is that many governments have not yet gotten to a level where they appreciate that, at least in this part of the world. And for the governments that have, I'll take Kenya as a case study, because it's one government that uh, collects uh, a revenue of close to two billion daily on the different government platforms that are run. We've got the M-Pesa, which transacts 1.5 billion every day in terms of uh, Kenyan citizens or those on M-Pesa transferring money from one person to another. There is the Kenya Revenue Authority uh, system that uh, collects up to $500 million daily and for that, when the, when, even when the exchange point is down, they go public to the press and they, they now announce us in the papers that we have interfered with the network. And then there is uh, the Huduma centers, which are the citizens' uh, interactive uh, areas for government services, which collect on, transact on a daily basis up to uh, about, currently up to $40 million. And we have only had them in about uh, five constituencies we, um, five counties, we are yet to um, reach out to the other 42 counties in Kenya. So by the time that happens, then you can see the dependence of government on the ICT infrastructure. In that kind of a scenario, the conversation is very different. And that is why coming into the Kenyan election, it was easier for us to just tell the government, we don't want an internet shut shutdown. And every government office, the regulator, the minister, the office of the president all committed on not having an internet shutdown. In other countries, it is different because the government is not dependent on the internet. The citizens are dependent on the internet in, for their business activities, which the government has not yet understood or may not be aware of. And as a result, when the government is shutting down the internet, they are forgetting that if these businesses do not operate, then they cannot get revenue. It eats into the ability of those businesses to file taxes. And if a government cannot collect revenue in the form of taxes, then how will they operate? So without realizing it, the governments are actually shooting themselves in the foot every time they have the instigator shutdown. And so um, following the long period of internet shutdown in Cameroon, three Kenyans came together, three residents of Kenya, a Kenyan, some are Kenyans, others were not, but we are res resident in Kenya, homed in Kenya. We came together and we discussed the challenges that there were, and we thought that it would be good to have more pressure on the Cameroonian government to be able to open up the internet. And we, are, we, we looked at options, and we are operating in an environment where we lack a global 
entity that has got the power to be able to put pressure on the governments to conform and to allow the internet to stay open. Because the UN had talked to them, but it wasn't really being felt. Uh, other governments, African Union, everyone had communicated. There's a lot of press and everything out there. So we wrote a very draconian, please not very, very arcade and draconian policy proposal as the technical community where we were proposing to shut down the governments that shut down the internet. So if a government shuts down the internet, we will look at how many days it's done. We will come back and investigate. Then once we confirm that uh, the internet was actually down, as a technical community, we withdraw all their IP resources. Now, without IP resource, you can't be on the internet. So uh, that way we get, we, we now end up shutting down the entire country, including all the other businesses. But you see, because it will be a proposal that has been uh, in the public domain, this uh, advance warning. But when we were this, putting that together, it was really for the main purposes of dangling the stick. Because that was the only stick we thought that the Cameroonian government would be able to respond to. Three days after the proposal went viral, we released it on a, on a Thursday. By Sunday, it had gone round and translated to so many different languages. Some I couldn't even understand and were being asked to explain ourselves and to comment. And there was a lot of uh, media uh, coverage on the whole proposal. But we knew that the technical community was not, would not be comfortable with that proposal because the guidelines under which proposals are accepted within the technical community were not met with that proposal. However, it served its purpose. We dangled the stick. The UN put pressure on Cameroon, and uh, the net was back up. So the goal and the purpose for that was achieved. OK. Um, so at the end of the day, um, it looks like it's a an issue of the rule of law, and um, we are looking at uh, many, many different ways of uh, confronting the issue. Um, and well, there are economic aspects to um, the proposal that uh, did not come to be, but um, as you've explained, you um, had an effect. And um, uh, coming to you, Walter, I'm just uh, wondering um, whether you also agree, whether you see this as as much as it's an economic uh, issue, it, it's also a rule of law issue. And so if it's a rule of law issue, where does the law come in? And can the law aid us uh, in matters of um, shutdowns? I think there is definitely this connection between rule of law and economic impact. Um, it might sound like a slight tangent, but I'll get around to why. But Looking at it, they have defined the rule of law as being a constituent of four pillars. That is accountability, that both private and public actors are treated the same before the law. It's just laws, that laws are applied evenly and in a, obviously in a just way um, and publicized and accessible. Third pillar being an open government, that is that the creation of those laws, the promulgation of those laws is an open and democratic process. And the fourth being that there is an impartial dispute resolution uh, system in place as well. So, uh, and I mean, just using perhaps South Africa uh, as some context, is that the rule of law is such an important aspect of a democratic uh, system or country for that matter, that once it has been undermined, it uh, obviously in undermines and erodes the bedrock of, of the democracy in which uh, that abuse occurred. So I I breaking it down even further, the rule of law is basically that in a, in a public setting, in a governmental setting, that no government actor, no government entity is, can act outside of the boundaries of the law. So. Now, when you have something like an internet shutdown, you are basically, it, it's, it's an, a, a direct violation of the rule of law in the sense that, say, the Cameroonian shutdown as an example, where Anglophone communities were shut down or deprived of communication um, based on sort of those communities' uh, issues with, with the Francophone majority government. 
So there's an instance of the law not being applied evenly or uh, across the board uh, on a consistent level. Um, but so I suppose the point that I'm trying to make then is that, and uh, back to the Cameroonian example, that if you have a legal system or a system that underpins a democratic system is undermined, then how will you place faith in that system to promote economic growth for that matter? It, it creates too much uncertainty. And an example that I read back to the Cameroonian one was that this sort of concept of the Silicon Mountain, which they have in, in Cameroon, where originally uh, it was a great sort of growth place for, for startups and entrepreneurs, was now seen as this it, all the potential that and goodwill that had been built up was systematically broken down by uh, the internet shutdown that they had. So just quickly bringing it back, and, and hopefully I'll get to speak a little bit more on this, is that uh, in terms of economic impact and how it's connected to the rule of law, is that economic growth is sort of built on trust and we want to build entrepreneurship and people need confidence in the system for that to work. So once you undermine one pillar of that system, then I, I, I believe that it creates this propensity for, for abuse. So um, before we come to the second part of the question, which is whether we have any recourse in law for, for internet shutdowns, I'm just wondering off the top of my head because we generally think that South Africa is a country that has rule of law do you ever think there'll be like a shutdown in South Africa? <laughs> a very good question. It's something that I, I've thought about and I've always found it slightly difficult to phrase, but <laughs> I suppose one of the, the biggest problems with internet shutdowns is that they are somewhat, they come out of the blue. I mean, and that's why the impact is so harsh because you, Okay, some countries now it's become slightly, um, it, it, it's sort of the MO slightly, the modus operandi, um, and then people are fearful. I mean, like the Kenyan elections, people were, were afraid that it was going to happen, so they, maybe there was some preparation. Um, but like I was saying, so the impact is that it just sort of comes out of nowhere in certain circumstances. Uh, but back to your question, sorry, um, in South Africa, It's a tough question. I do think that, and I mean, I can only really comment because this is the sort of context that we operate in. And I'm not to say that other countries don't have this. It's not really for me to comment on. But I think we do have pretty onerous checks and balances in place. Not to say that that can prevent an internet shutdown, but it may lessen the propensity of it occurring. Um, and we have a very aggressive sort of opposition party if it's a purely governmental exercise. Um, but yeah, it's okay. very difficult. We're, we're gonna keep looking yeah. up to you, South Africa. <laughs> and um, still on, on, on the issue of, um, sorry guys, I really love the law and courts. But I'm thinking, um, if if you are actually to go to court to to litigate uh, about an internet shutdown, you would need to um, quantify your losses. Is that is that how they say it in law? Quantify your losses. So I'm I'm wondering, um, uh, what, what be you work uh, in um, in the region a lot in the region. I'm wondering whether we have the right tools to be able to quantify the losses and um, Maybe what is the direction? How far have we gone in terms of uh, trying to really understand the, the, the losses or the economic uh, impact of uh, a shutdown? Thanks, thanks, Grace. I don't think that we have the, the right tools, but we are generating uh, tools that are taking us closer to, to the right tools. We have had, uh, for instance, in Uganda, um, suits against the shutdown. 
And actually, one of the, the, the arguments that was made was not just uh, the human rights issue, that this went against uh, our right to access information or to express ourselves and associate with other individuals, but also the economic losses which they claimed they had suffered. In Uganda last year, if you recall, there were two shutdowns. The first one, I think on February 11, mobile money services were also shut down. So the, the case which was made uh, unsuccessfully, as far as I know, was that people suffered um, economic losses, partly because of the, the shutting down of mobile money services. Obviously, people suffered, but um, I think the quantification of the cost is something that uh, has not been done sufficiently. Um, but understanding the economic cost of shutdowns would on not only serve the purposes of the uh, litigation and um, asking for damages. I think it, it serves uh, a, a broader purpose for, for civil society, a broader purpose for uh, telecom service providers and other individuals that make money out of uh, um, uh, being connected to, 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 to the internet. Uh, uh, Fiona Asonga talked about uh, the very many ways in which um, um, ICT contributes to our economies. You, we have very high access numbers. I think in Africa we have uh, um, penetration rates of telephone like at 80%, uh, internet is in the same ranges. We know the actual usage is less, but uh, it is at least 22% of Africans use the internet, although connection rates are in the 80s. That's a huge number of people that would be directly affected in case of a shutdown. However, we also need to know that once there is a shutdown, the entire economy is affected because of the efficiencies and connectedness which exist in the economy that are enabled by ICTs. Um, African economies, on average, der derive at up to 5% of, of their GDP is coming from, uh, um, I from ICT. And yet, those calculations actually do not take into consideration some of the contributions that cannot be measured or which governments are not measuring. So it becomes very important for us to now find ways of establishing what exactly is it that we are losing in case of a shutdown so that we can be able to make the case to governments. Maybe if you want to see the case for human rights, you see the business case uh, for not shutting down the internet. If we don't see the case for human rights, we might see the case for from a business perspective. Uh, and Fiona is smiling because she knows uh, I have um, a question for her, which is a question that many people are asking uh, as far as um, uh, telecommunication companies go, that um, there has not been um, enough, um, they are not giving us uh, enough, uh, say, data or information that would help uh, to quantify or to understand the actual economic impact of uh, a shutdown. And uh, still going back to the question of business, um, uh, as far as uh, telcos go, and so that would be the question to Fiona, but as far as uh, telcos go, and, and, and one thorny issue has been um, the question of licensing um, and um, how these licenses, uh, are, we are told that they prevent us from um, being more prepared. Um, he was talking about the issue of how internet shutdowns just happen out of the blue. So these licenses prevent us from uh, being more prepared, um, from having prior knowledge about the, the internet shutdown, because the licenses, which we don't know, most of which we don't know uh, what they contain, but 
um, so it becomes an issue of um, uh, would it help uh, or is this an issue you're discussing at GNI if we had more um, knowledge, if there was more transparency on what these licenses uh, are all about? And um, yeah, um, would this help us to be more prepared so that we can mitigate the economic uh, losses that occur uh, from these uh, shutdowns? That was, that, was for, that was for me. Yes, yeah. hashtag Andrew. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I'm the right person to really answer that question, although I kind of I'll circle it for a little bit. Um, so I think uh, I, I think it probably would help. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know the technical details of how it would work, but um, <laughs> so I think the I mean the obvious challenge for and I'm not I mean I'm a civil society representative on the GNI board, so I'm not necessarily there to to kind of argue for the telecommunications companies. Um, but I do see uh, and I do sympathize uh, to some extent with uh, the fact that uh, they are operating in uh, uh, within a country that has a legal framework that they uh, need to comply with in one way or another and that they have local staff and that there is leverage from the state over uh, these actors. Uh, having said that, you know, it's also a choice uh, for companies to operate in countries. So um, that's that's what they have to deal with. But I I think it's... it's um, I, I can't go into, because uh, I don't know, I would love to go into the detail of what that would, uh, how that could be shared, but uh, I think that would definitely be a question for the telcos rather than for, for a, a soft uh, civil society actor like myself. Um, can I just very quickly um, add, because I think when we think about, the, uh, about this issue, I, I don't think it's enough to think about it as a just a business perspective. I think when civil society engages with government, it's also to, it's proactively pointing out that these are the huge losses to all of us. Um, these are the huge economic losses to all of us if this happens in, um, in, our, in, our, um, in this country. So it's, it's also about recognizing that I think more often than not, we underestimate how little people know what the impact of a shutdown is. Um, I think we assume that everyone knows this is gonna be bad for the economy, everyone. But when, once you have the data in front of you, once you have the numbers in front of you, I. Actually, I envision that actually a lot of regulators might actually stop and be like, I did not realize that it was going to be that impactful if I shut down the internet even for a, a minute, uh, 30 minutes for one hour. And now that I have this data, perhaps we should have, um, so I think in law, one of the things that um, we talk about in law is that it's not only is this action the right action, but was there a better way to achieve the same result? So perhaps now suddenly a regulator realizes that this is too high a cost, Maybe there's another way for me to achieve the same result by shutting, of, uh, rather than shutting down the internet. So I do wonder sometimes that when we call economic impact studies of just business cases, if we're ignoring the, the huge, very personal impact that it can have um, on, on this. And that's why I find um, the work that Wakavi and Sipesa have done on their economic studies so interesting. Um, firstly, because it's gone even further than Deloitte and Brookings where it's pointing out the very unique nature of how the internet is used in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and it's gone, it started to think about not just mobile money, but apps like WhatsApp and Facebook and how people are using those. And from very personal experience, my mother in Harare, um, she uses WhatsApp to sell her eggs and chickens to her church group, then gets paid via EcoCash, which is the mobile money in Zimbabwe, and then uses that to pay my baby brother's school fees. That is a very personal, um, uh, that is a very personal impact then if suddenly the internet is shut down. And what we're saying is now that Sepesa is creating a framework to say, how do we create a model framework where countries and governments can think about such a disruption with that activity in mind in a way that no other region, I think, is using the internet in that way? But of course, because Africans are always doing the most unique things um, with, um, with what we're given. So I, I, I think we need to think a lot broader than just arguing that economic impact studies are just business cases. They're not business cases. For my mother, that's a very personal case. So, and being able to see that data and for her to be able to see that actually a lot of other businesses, not just in Zimbabwe, but in Sub-Saharan Africa operate the same way, is fantastic. So the report that Sepesa has worked on has in, has st is going to start a conversation in our region in a way that the Brookings and Deloitte studies were perhaps good starting points but now we're gonna be able to go further with data. 
Um, okay. Um, Fiona, we're just going to come to you in a minute because I think um, you have a lot of... Uh, I have a response to the okay. question. Yes. So, uh, uh, but first, starting off with mine, and maybe just in answer to what you raise about uh, looking at it from an economic point of view. Right now, we've got a lot of civil society people in the house. How many people sitting here don't work for civil society? Great, me included. Now, how many of you civil society organizations own the premises in which you run your businesses? How many of you have volunteers working for them? You pay no bills for HR, you've got total volunteers. Okay, now in the business space, the first impact of a shutdown is on the HR. And that is something that civil society, human rights groups can easily pick and run our, around with to the governments. Because when, when the internet goes down and there's no revenue coming into this business, how are the HR costs supposed to be met? How are the overheads of rent and other administrative costs supposed to be met? So basically what happens is that uh, there's a shutdown. For the period there's a shutdown, uh, because the company has got contract service level agreements with the customers, they end up having to uh, give credit for periods to cover up as part of uh, building the relationship for their businesses. So they have to issue credit notes. They have to refund, in some cases, refund money back to some of the customers for the services that were never delivered. If it was supposed to be maybe a particular service for a particular day, for a particular event, you have to refund the money. When those monies are going back out of the company to refund, and to, those, those are just the list of some of the losses. So the, in, 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 uh, in return, staff can't be paid. Is there any HR resource that will come in for free? How many of us would like to work for free? We have got expenses. Individuals have expenses. They have their basic rights of shelter need to be met. So it's very easy to connect the shutdowns to agendas for civil society and for civil society, human rights groups to pick those and to run with them. And there is the starting point of where the losses begin because then you can't meet your HR overheads. So you send everybody home and uh, then you have to you keep minimum HR that you can manage. If the shutdown is extended, you send everyone home. Then it's extended again, and the building owner comes and wants to take over, wants to uh, confiscate your equipment and everything within the premises because you can't pay rent. <laughs> so at the end of the day, it becomes a social economic problem. We cannot look at the economy, economic part of it, without looking at the social implications of uh, people's uh, 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 employment contracts and how that affects. Their, their ability of the organization to even honor those, those uh, kind of agreements. Then there are the overheads of infrastructure that has been deployed, is not being used, and this is infrastructure that incurs wear and tear because of the way it's uh, uh, deployed. So the elements, natural elements of the wind, the everything are eating at it, it's not being used, and you'll have to do maintenance before you get back on. So... <laughs> um. <laughs> Um, true. I mean, um, um, I, for example, in Kenya, um, we don't have a very separate thing called economic rights because economic rights are part of the normal um, human rights, at least the way we've, we've couched it. So it's a very um, easy argument to sell, and I guess the issue is, um, is just taking it out there. But with this in mind, and uh, as we open it up to um, the audience, I just wanted to ask Walter whether you're seeing any move towards people seeking compensation for uh, losses uh, incurred um, uh, because of internet shutdowns, or whether this would even be like a, a, a policy at either regional or any of the country levels <laughs> to have uh, some sort of uh, monetary or uh, whatever kind of compensation for this kind of uh, losses that have been so aptly um, described by Fiona. And then after that, we, we are going to open it up to other perspectives from the audience. Um, I personally have not 
come across instances of, you know, where it's actually gone to, say, litigation level, where someone has brought a claim against government for, for compensation or loss uh, incurred due to an internet shutdown. And I think just from my perspective to a certain degree is, so, I mean, looking at, say, the um, Democratic Republic of the Congo, in which it has a law that justifies internet shutdown to a certain degree. So, if a shutdown occurs under the auspices of the law, in that sense, it's very difficult then to bring a claim against the government to say that, so it's basically a legalized internet shutdown. How can you then bring a claim for compensation against it? And I think that's going to be a very complicated legal argument to make. Um, maybe that that is why it's not as prevalent, because we we are well aware of the economic impact of internet shutdowns on on a macro level, and like Fiona spoke about now, on a, on a very micro level. Um, and why are we not seeing people approaching the government um, for compensation? I, it's not something I've come across yet, but it's well worth further research, though. Um, the, sorry, the second part of your... No, that was... Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, and Wakabi, Andrew has something to say, but maybe Wakabi can sorry, help wha us wha understand. Wha what was the question? You can help us understand uh, if there are actually economic losses from shutdowns, but uh, these companies are still up and running. So who's paying for the shutdowns? Or are we going to come to a point where uh, companies will have to pack and go because business has been so bad? Like, it's, it's a bit of a... One of the things which we, the argument that we make in the report, which we have uh, done, um, <laughs> There is just a brief of it um, available at the reception, but the, the report is on our website. One of the arguments we make is that the effects of a shutdown actually persist beyond the days over which there is a shutdown. Because supply networks will get uh, affected, um, over efficiencies will get affected. Like Fiona was saying, if you are going to pay your, your workers when you're not earning. That means maybe you are borrowing money and you are going to pay back with interest. So who, to, to try and answer your question, who then pays this cost? It is um, everybody doing their business who earns or whose income is affected by, by, by ICT and there's millions and millions of us, but it's also the national economy because the GDP ultimately will suffer. Now, to get to the issue of uh, whether a, an individual or an organization can be able to go and litigate on the basis of having lost income, I, I really don't know that. But even if that may not be the case, I think there is a lot that we can do with knowing what the economic impact is and uh, doing advocacy and involving the private sectors who are losing business, the civil society who are not earning um, and government officials making the case to them that you are affecting millions of livelihoods, you are affect negatively affected by economy, by instituting measures which are not necessary and proportionate, harm the economy, overall competitiveness of economies, over a long period of time beyond the few days that you may order a shutdown. True. Um, Andreas, then uh, Faz. I just wanted to add uh, add on. I thought this was a good time to advertise the fact that uh, GNI um, and its members uh, have a really useful resource uh, on legal frameworks. Um, th for those of us who may be feeling litigious, um, it's, a, it's a useful resource if, if you want to see what the uh, legal situation is. Um, it's, a, uh, it's online uh, and it focuses on the uh, all the legislation that pertains to uh, freedom of expression, privacy, cybercrime, uh, cyber laws of arising. Um, so it's a good resource for those of us who, who, who'd like to see uh, how a shutdown might fit within a, a legal standard. Thank you. Uh, we've been served. Um, and then very quickly, just to um, tag on to what uh, Wakabi was saying, is that what's fantastic about the study, because I think what, when we often talk about economic impact, we are only often just thinking about the five days that it was off. And Wakabi's point is that actually, 
for weeks and months thereafter, like investor confidence has been affected. Um, now suddenly people are starting to wonder how do I continue to run my business if this is gonna happen again in three months. And I think that represents a far truer reflection of a developing economy in our region than just talking about the three days that this internet was off. Um, and that's why I'm, like, I'm so excited about the study because now we can finally have, because I, I think it even goes further into looking at very specific targeted applications and trying to think like, how do we think about this if WhatsApp is targeted? How do we think about this if um, this specific application is targeted? And that presents a far truer reflection of what we're seeing in our region than anywhere else. So um, I, uh, when we think impact, we shouldn't just be thinking about the three days that my mother couldn't sell chickens. It's about how does she continue to um, decide on a business model for the next month? How does she grow her business? How does she encourage an outside investor to invest in it when they know that in Zimbabwe the internet can be shut down? And that's important, and that's what we should be thinking about when we say impact. Um, thank you for the intervention. Is there anybody who has a question? Um, Earlier on, as I get there, we were just thinking about the, there's this ease of doing business in Africa report, which the World Bank does and Kenya ranks very low because like to do business in Kenya, you have to pay a lot of facilitation fees and um, yeah, facilitation fees other than the license, other than the, the, the what is it, the legal fees, right? So we were saying that, um, and maybe it's also something that Fiona can explain later, that if it was so hard to get your license in the first place, and if you had to see so many government officials to get your license, is this affecting um, um, how private sector delivers services to um, the public? Is it affecting how private sector responds to internet shutdowns and how private sector has the relationship between private sector and its consumers and private sector and, and government. If we had more transparent ways of doing business, would it be easier for um, telcos to um, you know, talk to us when they suspect there's a shutdown coming up or to you know, compensate us for shutdowns? So it's, it's, is there something for other to think about as we get to the question. Um, this is a question for the whole panel. Very good. Hello? Yeah. Um, it's a question for the whole panel. Um, there is a very uh, strong emphasis on trying to use the concept of the costs of an, uh, the economic costs of a of shutdowns as a tactical method to get to a potential uh, legal uh, recourse for the shutdown. And I actually wonder whether what Access Now is doing, trying to find uh, stories of the harm done to people by shutdowns, is not a more effective route to find legal recourse against governments when shutdowns occur or are being threatened with. Because governments have an obligation not to harm their people. And this obligation is, as far as I know, embedded in quite a few constitutions and also in international treaties. And um, I just want to hear your reflection on this because yes, indeed, the economic costs of, an, uh, of damage done to all of us um, by governments when they shut down the internet is one route to hold them to account for it. But the other route might lead to more um, or even alternative routes to, 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 to get to the same. Um, yeah, is there any other question? Then we can take a round of questions or, um, okay. Thank you. Um, I would like to know whether um, there's a, whether the 
network providers um, and, and the, well, the network operators um, are actually being assertive enough in defending their customers' rights online? Um, are they being perhaps too easily intimidated by government requests for information, uh, government requests for shutdowns? Are they actually um, being strong enough? You know, ob obviously they have tremendous power over governments, I would think, because they can actually put government out of business as well. Um, are they doing enough, do you think, um, or could you make suggestions on how they could better protect their uh, private customers? Thank you. Is there another one? Okay, so we have three questions because I had the uh, privilege. There's the question on corruption and um, telcos. There's the question of the tactic, using um, uh, economic impacts as a tactic. And then there's the last question on whether um, telcos are doing enough to protect their relationship with their, and to deliver their duty to their customers. I don't know who wants to go first. Fiona. I'll go first and I will, uh, I, I don't want to answer all of them. So I'll answer the two that are specifically on the networks and the business, but they leave the others for the other panelists to also chip in. Uh, on corruption, yes, um, corruption sometimes has a significant impact on the ability of the service providers or businesses to be able to engage with government. And normally, there is no warning of a shutdown. Case in point, in uh, 2002, the government shut down the Kenya Internet Exchange Point. They just walked in, presented their identification, picked the gear, walked out. It took us one whole year going through a court process and uh, mediation with different stakeholders to get that gear back and to turn on the internet exchange point again. So there is never warning from government and, and uh, when, in as far as they help you to uh, set up the business, they don't expect that when they come to shut you down, that relationship counts. It doesn't count. Basically, this is, that's, that's uh, an account that you keep opening every time. It's a new account. Any deposits that have been done into it do not matter. On the issue of whether networks, network operators, ISPs, are doing, being assertive enough, I will say it depends on the regime and the government of the day. If the government is accommodative, it is possible to have the service providers spend time with government officials to create awareness on how the internet ecosystem works and uh, who is likely to suffer the most in the event of a shutdown, so that then they are more aware of what uh, is likely to happen. When, when I, I tend to believe when government officials understand what, how the technology works and the impact, they are more likely to empathize and to find other mechanisms of, of uh, dealing with issues that they have on the internet as opposed to total shutdowns. Case in point, there have been governments that will ask for, for certain uh, service providers to bring down certain content or they'll ask network operators to give them details of certain uh, users on the internet, where they're located, so we end up using the location services, we, get, uh, we use the the IP addresses, and we are able to then give them an exact location of where the respective entities are, and that they're able to get those individuals. But that is from a government that has taken time to understand how the ecosystem works. If the government does not understand how the ecosystem works and don't care to understand, it is very difficult for a CEO, a manager, a technical person, of any of the mobile operators or ISPs to have an exchange with someone pointing a gun at them. Because in such environments, they will come with armed police officers or military officers, and there's very little that the service provider can do. Where it is a written directive from, uh, say, the Ministry of ICT, even from the President, and there is normally room to sit on a round table and present, like Fazia has explained, present the issues and have a conversation around the impact and what it means. And those are very rare cases in this part of the world. What tends to happen is 
you are extremely intimidated. When they come in, you really can't say no and find your senior bosses, even the CEO is saying, I think your life is more important, let it go. Because at that time, it is a decision between the life of the team who are managing that infrastructure or keeping the infrastructure up and running. That is the decision that a service provider may need to make. So even as civil society comes in and it's talking about the rights, there's the, the rights of the team that manages the infrastructure that have to be <laughs> considered. Can I say something small about that before maybe you go to other participants? I think that uh, we understand from their licensing obligations and also fear of uh, other repercussions from governments. Operators don't want to annoy governments, but I think they should also do a little bit more not to annoy their clients. And they can. It can be baby steps. For example, um, increasingly, when governments issue orders, there are some governments, who, sorry, some telecom operators who publish those orders. Okay, so it gives us quick confirmation that there is a, a shutdown. Or when it is over, they issue those, those uh, some issue them like MTN and already they've done it for Cameroon, Uganda, DRC. I think that has an impact. It is said something. And as I mentioned a bit earlier today to some individuals, there was the 93-day the shutdown in Cameroon. Why doesn't MTN give us their earnings for those 393 days? And Orange also publishes them without doing any commentary on it. And then for us as people who are interested in this, we can be able to look at the figures and do some analysis and say, actually, there were these losses incurred as a result of that shutdown. And the other thing which they can do, small again, but which can contribute to them sort of pushing back or giving us a bit of a, um, ammunition to push for the internet premium agenda is by publishing transparency reports. So we know how many government uh, requests for disclosure of metadata on um, subscribers were made. How many do you comply with? We have huge operators on this continent like MTN operating in 19 countries. They never give us any of that information. Airtel, they never give us that information. And yet that can start to tell us what is happening and for us to use that as government's questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So very briefly, I mean, I, I really would, especially in recent years, I would encourage people to read through some of the transparency reports of, of telcos and uh, also of tech platforms, but, and especially look for uh, what's not in there because that's what the really interesting bit is, what, what can't be put in writing. Um, and uh, from that, you can learn a lot <laughs> if you try to read between the lines of what is not in the transparency reports and uh, get um, transparency through that, um, th uh, through that way, yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, before I make my point, I think just to quickly address uh, the, the issue about the, um, the right tactic, I suppose. I don't think anyone is saying one tactic over the other or one in isolation or if you do black, you can't do white. Um, I think what we're saying is that the, big, the better picture you have overall, the better your argument is going to be. Um, the collection of stories is important, it's vital. Um, and I think a lot of that was done especially during, um, during the Cameroonian um, shutdown. And I think that's really important. The more data you can put in front of someone, the better decision they can make. So um, I don't think doing economic impact studies means that we should stop doing any other data collection at all. I just think that it's a matter of the more, the more research we have, the more data we have, the better arguments can be made. Um, and then very quickly, I think perhaps I, I even want to push back a little bit on the idea that um, those, these conversations around the telcos are rare in our region. I disagree. Um, I think Lesotho was a fantastic example last year where the um, Prime Minister sent an order demanding that uh, Econet um, shut access. And Econet, because it operates locally, because it had local relationships, went to the regulator and said, hey, I'm a little bit confused. Firstly, isn't this supposed to come from you? And secondly, is there an option for us to discuss this? And the regulator, because he had a personal relationship with the, the telcos, was like, okay, I hear you. Let's sit down and let's discuss this. And then Econet then went out, gathered data, the Brookings, and presented the Brookings and Deloitte studies to the regulator and the prime minister. Thereafter, the prime minister was like, okay, maybe this is not the greatest idea in the world, and then pulled back the, 
um, and then pulled back the, the request. So and I think it reiterates my point that I do think regulators really, uh, really do, regulators or ministries often don't know the impact of what's happening. But I also do think, and to Wakabi's point about baby steps, there's something to be said about encouraging telcos to create relationships within the countries that they operate in. I would, um, I think Econet did a fantastic job in the way that they dealt with that because the sort of, I think we all know, is going through a very difficult time. And despite the very difficult time and the very difficult political climate it was operating in, Econet felt confident enough in the relationships that they had built with the ministry and with the regulator <laughs> to not, maybe push back is the wrong word, but to say, can we at least discuss this? Can we hear what are your concerns and issues and perhaps we can present alternatives? That is why I said when there is a letter, there is room. There is room to negotiate. When it is put in writing in a letter, when it is not in writing in a letter, because sometimes it is just an ambush, it becomes very difficult to then have a negotiation. And um, I think the, unless there are other questions, I'm going to ask the, the panelists to um, give us some best practices that maybe they've noted from, um, from, from your work. And uh, also, no pressure, but <laughs> to give us sound bites for Twitter. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no pressure, I'm just kidding. But I, I think it would, uh, it's, it's, um, it's also important, and this is more of a personal thing for discussions in Africa, not to be so um, bogged in the whole, oh my God, there's so much trouble in Africa, we are always in problems, but also to highlight uh, some of the good things that are happening in the continent. Um, one of which, uh, by the way, is uh, CPESA's um, report on um, unmasking the, the economic effects of internet shutdowns, uh, which, as um, Wakabi has said, is available on the CPESA website, and there are also um, briefs uh, at the reception. So um, I don't know whether we want to start from um, my favorite person to pick up <laughs> on, or... Um, yeah, we could start with uh, I think with that you, and you've, you've framed that so, so right. I do think that there are definite best practices that do come from our region. Um, I think Kenya is a fantastic example about multi of how you um, discuss these issues on a multi-stakeholder -sta level that I would actually argue that in most parts of the world doesn't exist, where if we need to discuss internet shutdowns in a room in Kenya, you have the regulator, you have the minister, you have TESPOC, you have civil society, you have internet users at one table discussing this. So I, am, I would argue that that's a fantastic example, and I think that's one of the things that the rest of the world could learn from. Um, I think the idea of building personal relationships, like I indicated for Les from Lesotho, that is fantastic, and I also think that the rest of the world could learn from. But I also think what we're doing as a continent is we're arguing that the way that we use in the internet and the way that we use social media platforms is different. Um, and it's different all for various reasons. But because of that, we need to start thinking, how do we collect the stories in the right way and how do we get to tell our stories? I think something that goes far beyond just internet disruptions, but more generally, and that's the fantastic thing about why our platforms like WhatsApp, like Facebook, like Instagram, like Twitter are so fantastic, is because finally Africans are telling their own narratives about what they're experiencing either about through democracy, about social movements, but also about the impact about when, when those things are removed from their hands. So um, if I was to argue about what are best practices, I just think telling our stories and being able to show that these are the impacts for us and trying to argue from that perspective. And I think if anything, that is the track we need to use when you're talking to a regulator in your country, is to show him that this isn't about the impact of what this looks like in India. This is the impact of what this looks like for me in front of you in a country that we're both invested in. Um, the sound bite there is um, multi-stakeholderism. <laughs> Hashtag Kenya. <laughs> I'll just reframe what you said, I think. No, I think that was that was all really good points. I think the CEPESA report is uh, hugely valuable, and I think it's it it that itself is a best practice that many other regions in the world could really learn from. I mean, in the same way that uh, uh, the ICT ICT plays a unique role in um, Africa and individual African uh, states, um, I think uh, you know uh, other regions and other countries should take 
this methodology and adapt it to um, their unique situation because um, all countries are different and, and, and they will have a different uh, outcome in, with this methodology. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really, uh, really, really useful uh, outcome. And a, and, a, and a good practice to, to take further um, where the rest of the world can really learn from, from what Africa is doing. Um, well, as a legal practitioner, I think it would be remiss of me to not say or comment um, about the drafting of laws that reflect um, African circumstances and African situations. Um, we must move away from overbroad or um, outdated laws and definitions. We, if we have clauses that can be interpreted in a certain way and then justify internet shutdowns, that's something that needs to be addressed. And that generally can only happen through public engagement. Uh, not to discredit any civil societies out there, it's just to say that that is something that will be an issue now and for many years as uh, the legal system, and especially law drafting, is a very, very slow process but it must always be on the agenda. And we can't have justifications under uh, circumstances like national security or defense of the territory without actually defining what those terms mean. So a complicated exercise, but not complicated enough to, to not be engaged with, with every uh, opportunity. Um, so that would be my best practice uh, from a legal perspective. Thank you so much on behalf of all the legal practitioners who also do drafting. Um, we'll come to you, Wakabi. We'll first go with uh, Fiona. Okay, I think the take homes that um, I would encourage the civil society in the room to go with is finding ways of engaging your business community in your respective countries and have them together jointly uh, uh, share with your governments, different government stakeholders, it could be members of parliament, it could be the ministries of uh, ICT and internal affairs, because those are the ones that are likely to be involved in internet shutdowns, and also the ministries of finance because of the treasury, and they need to get that revenue. So if you're able to get those together and bring uh, and have a conversation around the ecosystem, how it works, and why it's important to keep it up, to keep the internet up, running, accessible, then also the business community should be able to offer to help government deal with specific incidences and to catch the culprits that are on the internet. Because in some cases, everyone is made to suffer because of a few people. So if, if uh, the business community, because the technical community has ways of getting these things done, if they are willing and are able to do it, You'll end up with a better conversation. You end up with a government that, that, that doesn't feel overly threatened by civil society and business, and they will be more accommodative and easier to support, like the case in uh, Lesotho that uh, Fazi just uh, highlighted. It is much more easier to have the conversation. But this takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. Why? Because we also are in situations where our our ministers get changed so fast. I think for the first time we've seen Trump change his uh, staff at the same pace as African presidents change their ministers. So <laughs> with that happening, it means you need to be ready every time the new guy is in. Make a courtesy call. Just ask to make, because that is how Chess Talk has evolved over time to a point that we now are called to sit with government to draft ICT policy to draft ICT agenda. The ICT master plan is never written if Chesspoke is not available to put in someone. So we always have to have someone sitting in to develop the ICT master plan, the uh, Kenya Cloud uh, Services master plan, the broadband strategy, the cybersecurity strategy. So we are involved. We are involved in those conversations because we have built a relationship over time where the ministry staff who don't have the capacity to feel we can trust Chesspoke to help us. Why, when you help them and then you help them and try and keep it discreet and make them feel comfortable, nobody wants again to be helped and then it is in the paper somewhere, oh, we are helping do this. Governments don't like that. So you handle them appropriately. You build that relationship like you would with a person you want to really form a personal engagement with for the purposes of being able to create this internet ecosystem that we all need to be able to 
facilitate our social activities as, our, as well as our business engagement. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, uh, Fiona. Um, and as I ask uh, Wakabi for his um, uh, thoughts on uh, best practices, maybe I could also ask you for the sake of those who um, joined us later to just um, summarize for us, the, uh, tell us the key points of the, of the study, the CIPESA study on um, economic impact of shutdowns in um, sub-Saharan Africa in a way that we can tweet. Okay. <laughs> no pressure. Th thank you, um, uh, Grace Motongo. Um, I think building personal relationships is very important, which also echoes the idea of multi-stakeholderism. So we need to build those personal relationships and engage very many stakeholders, but we need to go uh, to them with evidence. And one of the greatest evidences that we can go with is what uh, this means in terms of uh, economic costs. So what we have uh, done, this study here, is uh, that it uh, looks at previous studies which were on uh, how to measure the cost of an economic shutdowns and it adapted it to a sub-Saharan context. Deloitte and the Brookings Institution had done the two most definitive studies so far. So we took their models, which basically relied on uh, GDP, and applied them to the African context, bearing in mind some unique features, uh, like the use of uh, certain applications, like uh, the place of the mobile um, connectivity uh, versus other connectivities. And then we also factored in um, other imperatives, such as um, loss of confidence in the economy or in the use of vice cities as a result of shutdowns. And we came up with a model which can now be used to measure uh, a shutdown if it is a total and also a partial shutdown that affects only uh, a few applications and services. So we, we think this can be applicable in very many instances and we encourage very many people to use it. But we also say that this is not definitive because there are so many things that can be measured which have not been measured, just like Deloitte and uh, Brookings measured some things. We added on to the gamut of issues that have been measured, but we did not measure absolutely everything. So this is an estimate, and that is why it is titled uh, estimate, not a definitive final figure. But it gives us uh, a number which you can make, which, which you can use to make the case when you are talking to whether it is regulators or policy makers or uh, telecom operators. It makes our life a bit easier. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wakabi. Um, I invite everybody to get a copy of um, the report together with the GNI um, flyer on. Um, uh, yes, we have a uh, one pager. It's about there. He has, yeah, there's a one pager that uh, uh, also explains the, the economic impact. Um, we, I, I don't know whether I should announce it in a very. Um, uh, old school kind of way or in a very new school kind of way. With that, viewers, we have come to the end of our program. <laughs> or <laughs> whether I should say, we are going to form a WhatsApp group to continue this conversation. <laughs> Give me your numbers um, after this. Uh, but thank you very much for engaging with us. And um, you're welcome to tea and coffee. <laughs>